you for the uh, kind introduction, Benjamin, and for uh, your invitation. It's a sincere honor and a pleasure to lecture in your prestigious series um, uh, this evening. And uh, I too wish that we could gather in person, but I'm, I'm grateful that we're able to uh, gather in this way. So I've titled the talk Transdisciplinary Architecture, and I will be discussing three topics, um, starting with adaptive materials and presenting uh, a few research projects uh, that are ongoing in my lab at Cornell AAP. Uh, and then moving into adaptive structures with an emphasis on 3D printing. And then finally looking at adaptive environments uh, where I'll discuss primarily uh, built projects uh, that have been developed in my practice, uh, Jenny Saban Studio. So I wanted to start uh, with these two illustrations uh, to talk about the thinking uh, behind the work uh, and how we turn to nature uh, for design uh, inspiration as, as a way of thinking in terms of processes and behavior. Uh, so on the left is a painting by John Piper and, and this was used as a front piece for Conrad Waddington's uh, seminal book titled Organizers and Genes. And in the image which is intended to represent the epigenetic landscape, uh, we see a rare view behind the scenes of Waddington's uh, landscape, where each valley in the landscape is formed by tension on guy ropes that are attached to nodes of genes uh, represented as pegs in the illustration stuck in the ground. And as Sanford Quinter uh, writes in his essay, Landscapes of Change, uh, which was published in 1993 in Assemblage, he states, Quote, and he's referring to this, this illustration. Epigenetic landscape seen from below. The complex relief features of the epigenetic surface are themselves largely the expression of a prodigiously complex network of, of, of interactions underlying it. The guy ropes are tethered not only to random points on the overhead surface, but to points on other guy ropes as well and to pegs in the lower surface that themselves represent only semi-stabilized forms, thus multiplying exponentially the non-linearities flowing through the system. Not to diminish in importance either is the tension surface above as a distinct domain contributing its own forces to the field. No change in any single parameter can fail to be relayed throughout the system and to affect in turn conditions across the entire event surface." End quote. So I'm very interested in looking at how context specifies form, function, and structure as a set of integrated uh, scenarios and feedback loops. Uh, so in our turning to nature uh, for design drivers, it's never about simply scaling up what might be a beautiful form or image, but to probe behind the image. What are the processes and the behaviors uh, that are contributing to those morphological dynamic conditions, and importantly, considering the role of context or environment uh, in that integrated scenario, which is very much in keeping with this description of the epigenetic landscape. And I'll come back to epigenesis in a moment. And then briefly on the right, uh, we see a drawing, an exquisite drawing by the structural engineer, Robert Le Ricolet, who also turned to nature uh, for design inspiration, uh, but again, was interested in the dynamic forces flowing through geometry and matter as a ground for thinking. Uh, and so he developed uh, these analog models, uh, drawings, constantly working back and forth in attempting to understand an analog, to explore the, the possibility of how the order of construction follows the order of deconstruction. And so he was very interested in this sort of aspects of beauty and failure. Uh, again, looking at form as a dynamic set of scenarios where the forces flowing through geometry and matter contribute to form in context. 
And this very much is akin to how we think through a design problem um, as, an, as an analog of natural systems, as a biosynthetic uh, investigation of process and behavior. So we often start with, with very simple parts uh, and rules, uh, exploring part to whole relationships and bottom up generative design thinking uh, that through feedback and iteration produce much more complex uh, spatial holes. Uh, and this is polymorph that was part of uh, the Archilab exhibition now uh, permanently installed uh, there in Orléans, uh, which is where I first met um, Benjamin um, as we were both in this exhibition. This interest also, of course, probes the productive tinkering and misuse of digital fabrication machines, uh, frequently uh, found in alternate industries, uh, such as the textile industry, and of course, uh, automotive industry, working with a uh, large industrial robots. We're also interested in how this in, is informed by issues of craft and making uh, to produce bio-inspired material systems and software design tools that have the capacity to facilitate embedded expressions in our built environments. Importantly, we also contribute to fundamental science, uh, operating as architects, collaborating with scientists uh, to address uh, questions and problems of scientific nature. It's never been about turning architects and designers into pseudo-scientists or scientists into pseudo-designers, uh, but to engage in a truly collaborative uh, space. Um, working across scales and bringing our expertise uh, and, and an ability to synthesize and address a complex array of questions. And also of course, to bring our technical expertise in terms of making sense of big data uh, and through visualizations and simulations and models. And these are some of the uh, covers uh, that we have um, take, been a part of as part of ongoing research projects uh, spanning biomedicine, uh, 3D printing, and designing with DNA for pro programmable matter and beyond. So one of the fundamental questions that we ask is how might organisms respond to and adapt uh, to their built environments? And I believe in the not so distant future, materials will not just be elements and things in buildings, but that they will generate immersive spaces acting upon and responding to affordances in our built environments. So like the cells in our own bodies, sensors and imagers will learn and adapt, making materials not only smart, but also aware and beautiful. So a seminal reference um, for my work is the biological um, extracellular matrix, which is a dynamic protein network uh, that physically and, and chemically couples the exterior environment of, of cells with their interior and vice versa. And this matrix environment is a cell-derived woven and globular protein network uh, that contacts most cells uh, within the body. And so my longtime collaborator, uh, Dr. Peter Lloyd-Jones, uh, who's trained as a cell and molecular biologist, uh, introduced me to the ECM uh, as early as 2005. And that presented to me and my students and my research associates, a series of very powerful uh, ecological models to consider uh, as an analog, as a way of thinking uh, and understanding how context, the extracellular matrix in, this, um, in these models and data uh, specify form, function, and structure. And so the big idea here is that half the secret to life uh, resides outside of the cell. So you have DNA, uh, which of course contributes to formation, uh, but that DNA is acted upon by external events uh, within the ECM. Uh, we eventually started Lab Studio in 2006 um, when we were both teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, which to our knowledge was at the time the first uh, truly collaborative hybrid research and design lab and studio um, environment bringing together architects and uh, biologists uh, and biochemists and material scientists into a truly collaborative space. And I think that was the most important deliverable um, that we developed uh, over the six years uh, that we were engaged in Lab Studio. We recently published a book uh, on the methods, tools, uh, projects, 
and, and really the thinking uh, that was developed uh, in Lab Studio um, titled Design Research Between Architecture and Biology. And one thing that I wanted to point out, um, before Peter and I started to collaborate formally, we spent a year uh, joining in each other's lab meetings and studio reviews, uh, just figuring out how to communicate effectively. And what we, we quickly learned is that although we shared similar terms uh, in terms of language, we had very different definitions uh, for those terms. Um, and that investment of time of building trust, developing a collaborative relationship, and figuring out how to talk to each other and how to structure our days um, that you know, would work uh, uh, to figure out how to teach, to co-teach, uh, was an incredibly useful investment of time, probably one of the most um, kind of useful periods uh, early on. Another longtime collaborator, uh, Dr. Xu Yang, um, we continue to work together uh, on projects. Uh, she's a material scientist engaged in biomimicry uh, in the true definition of the word. Uh, she looks at the leaves of lotus plants and the feet of gecko uh, to produce super hydrophobic and super hydrophilic materials, uh, sticky materials. Uh, and so she's interested in turning to nature uh, to extract principles, rules, characteristics, to then design and engineer entirely new materials. And so we have focused on um, certain topics such as structural color and programmable materials um, as a point of departure. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. And then more recently, uh, Dan Lau, who's a biological and environmental engineer here at Cornell. Uh, we've been working with his lab um, in the last several years, innovating materials that actuate based on their own uh, programming uh, in terms of their geometry and importantly, designing with DNA. Uh, and we've developed um, some interesting applications uh, in terms of a DNA glaze uh, where we're able to steer and direct uh, particular effects uh, through light emission, uh, but just an amazing creative thinker um, involving 3D printing and the design of, of DNA sequences uh, for particular material um, actuations. So over the last uh, 15 plus years, uh, we've developed a way of working um, that is formalized. Uh, we by no means follow a linear process, but we typically start with a design of tools uh, to model behavior. Uh, those tools might be working with a particular biological data set, a material a system or an abstract algorithmic um, process. And I like to think of, of software as a new type of materials. So like all of you, we develop our own scripts uh, and, and tools uh, to look at process and behavior as an active set of conditions. And then some of those tools are brought into the realm of architectural prototyping uh, to productively contaminate the process of making, uh, which also uh, in a rigorous fashion helps us to grapple with scale. You know, because not all of these systems that we're exploring are scalable. And then finally, some of those successful prototypes are then brought into the realm of the built environment, uh, engaging issues of building ecology. So I'm going to briefly touch upon uh, what is now an, an older project, uh, but it's a seminal project, uh, both in terms of uh, what it contributed to uh, in terms of putting a kind of institutional stamp on the high risk, highly uh, experimental uh, research uh, that we were engaged in early on in Lab Studio. And, and this also kicks off uh, the first of three topics uh, looking at adaptive materials. So in, in 2010, uh, the National Science Foundation, which is our largest uh, federal funding agency uh, in the engineering and design arts here in the States, uh, put out a call for collaborative teams that would include architects. And they were interested in how these teams might fundamentally rethink the problem of sustainability in, in buildings and specifically to address issues of building heat gain in high rise structures. So we had about five years of, of work 
um, you know, collaboration under our belts uh, at that time. And we put in a proposal uh, to develop a thin film technology that would be integrated into either existing uh, energy hungry buildings into their facades as skins uh, or into new facade design. And these are, um, this is our team, which included material scientists, mechanical engineers, uh, biologists, and architects. So we were fortunate to be one of 10 teams across the states uh, to re receive a multi-million dollar grant, um, which in architecture is, is a huge grant. And what I've come to learn is that in the sciences, it, that's actually quite small. Um, and I owe a tremendous amount to my scientific collaborators uh, for showing me the ropes, so to speak, uh, in terms of developing proposals and really learning what it takes uh, to go after these science and engineering based uh, federal grants. Uh, and another thing that I learned is that you don't receive these large NSF grants if you haven't received prior NSF funding, um, which uh, you know is sort of counterintuitive. So aligning oneself uh, with collaborators uh, that have been successful in procuring these grants uh, is, is very important. And so this is what we, we pitched to them, uh, which builds upon uh, the cardinal features of the extracellular matrix that I just described. And so we were interested in this notion of a dynamic reciprocity between the building skin and the local environment. And so what you see here is a human smooth muscle cell, which has been plated onto an organic polymer uh, called a PDMS. And we worked with the material scientists to design various patterns and fabrication techniques and we were interested in how changes in geometry and compliance and patterning would then turn, would then alter the behavior of the cell. Uh, so you can actually see the cytoskeleton of the cell lassoing up and around uh, these pillars and the nucleus here uh, stained in, in blue. Uh, and you can see the difference in terms of what's happening with a wrinkled surface. So we were by no means proposing to put human cells on buildings that would never ever work. Um, they would quickly become confluent and die. Uh, but at this stage of the research, the cell was our muse. And so we developed a whole series of catalogs of, of simulations to understand and to model these behaviors so that we could then with the mechanical engineers develop sensors and imagers and material characteristics in terms of programming uh, that would adapt uh, and respond to local environmental cues. And so we focused on structural color uh, as one primary topic. Uh, so just to get a little bit more in detail, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into the technical aspects of this project, we have um, several peer reviewed papers on the lab website, uh, which I'll show you at the end. Uh, so what you see here is, um, the e-skin material, and it's been fabricated with, in this case, a series of holes. And so when you stretch this material or it undergoes a mechanical deformation, those holes or pillars then begin to change their orientation uh, at a nano scale. And what that does is that it changes the way that light is reflecting and refracting locally at the same wavelength. Uh, and we in turn perceive either a dynamic switch between transparent to opaque or also a change in color. So it has to do with human perception and the behavior of light at a particular wavelength um, of the material. So we started to develop our own rendering engines. There was you know, nothing out there that could deal with the complexity of this material, developing simulations, uh, prototypes to explore what these material effects might be uh, at a human scale, at a room scale. And then finally, uh, we developed this uh, human scale prototype that took about two years collaborating at both the lab and the studio bench side, uh, developing this entirely from scratch. Uh, this is uh, now part of the permanent collection at the Frock, um, which was also on view as part of naturalizing architecture. And just to give you a, a little bit more detail, there's an array of uh, sensors that detect a change in light intensity. Uh, so when you enter a room or you wave your hand like she was doing here, uh, it detects that change in light intensity, 
then sends a very small regional charge to the components, which are composed of ITO conductive glass and a solution of nano colloidal particles, uh, which then exhibit a dynamic switch uh, in opaque to transparent or a color change. Um, so therefore exhibiting a structural color change. So we are really proud of that development. And this is where we're at now in terms of uh, seeking industry partners uh, to really move this to a viable uh, industry uh, product, a thin film uh, that would be integrated uh, into existing facade design um, as a, a double layer. Uh, more recently, and building upon the Eastkin project, uh, we've embarked upon a unique collaboration with the Defect Lab at Arizona State University uh, to innovate and design uh, engineering of building integrated uh, photovoltaics, uh, known as VIPVs. Uh, through computational design and 3D printing uh, to create highly customized non-standard filters and panels uh, that result in site-specific non-mechanical tracking solar collection systems. Um, and one of the things that we were interested in, uh, my collaborator Mariana Bertoni, who's an expert uh, in uh, the engineering of BIPVs, is the role of, of aesthetics and designing with light and energy in a much more systematic and integrated way. Uh, and that's where 3D printing and working with non-standard orientations uh, can really be uh, leveraged. So we started with um, biological adaptations, including heliotropic mechanisms and sunflowers and the light scattering structures in lithop plants, uh, really amazing, amazing plants. Uh, to explore non-conventional configurations of panels uh, to design with light and energy, uh, and importantly, to maximize energy conversion efficiency. So our proposal, uh, as we have discovered in the last uh, year of research, uh, follows solar path data and also omits the typical 50% additional structural metal and 30% copper uh, cable per uh, panel module. Uh, which importantly significantly decreases the carbon intensity by about 15% uh, for a typical prototype uh, tested in the southwest of the US. And as a result, um, our proposal, which is titled Agrivoltaic Pavilion, demonstrates uh, one of the first adaptable systems uh, with extremely low greenhouse gas emissions, uh, showcasing the potential as a a prototype, a prototypical demonstrator of sustainable design for resilient land use models to provide an integrated approach uh, to food, energy, and water. So our emphasis upon designing with light and energy, uh, looking specifically at topics of structural color uh, and how light uh, and local contextual cues influence uh, materials, you know, continues to drive a lot of the work uh, in my lab uh, and a lot of the fundamental research uh, that is continuing uh, with my collaborators uh, in bioengineering, material science and biology, as well as mechanical engineering. So moving to uh, adaptive structures and form, um, you'll see that there are many overlaps uh, between these three categories, but they, they also define kind of areas of inquiry, especially in terms of scale. So as with the Eastkin project, uh, we're designing uh, frequently at the nano scale um, uh, in, in terms of how we're contributing to the design and of those patterns in various geometric assemblies uh, and guiding uh, the performance of, of light and, and importantly human interaction and perception. So in addition to innovating adaptive and responsive materials, we also work with non-standard components uh, to investigate the rapid manufacturing of full-scale 3D printed parts uh, for larger architectural assemblies. And we first purchased our uh, 3D printer. It was our, the first 3D printer in, in the lab. And this was in Lab Studio. Uh, and this printer, which is an old powder-based Z-Corp printer is, is still uh, in my lab here at Cornell. Um, and we were interested in, as I mentioned, uh, working at a one-to-one -one scale. So not using the printer as a representational tool, but to rapid manufacture parts and therefore expand the potential of the build bed uh, in terms of looking at larger assemblies. Uh, running alongside that, uh, 
Peter Lloyd Jones, my collaborator, who I mentioned, we we were interested in the promise of you know what it would be like if you could hold your data. So if we could develop, and we were parametric models of these cellular systems, multicellular systems, and as an analog, uh, then developing families of prints, how might holding one's data influence the, the scientific process, allowing the scientist uh, to project into um, the problem at hand uh, through a different um, kind of context, uh, in both in terms of material, but also space. And so it was during the production of, of some of those early prototypes that I began to tinker with our powder printer. And uh, in addition to my background in, in architecture, my professional degree in architecture, I have a BFA in ceramics and a BA in interdisciplinary visual art. Um, so I have a background as a fine artist uh, and as a maker, I thought I had long since left you know, my, my practice and work with clay behind me. Uh, but I began to sort of be quite curious as to the potential of what this material uh, might afford. And I discovered that I literally had a body of knowledge that I could then bring to a, a new set of questions and trajectories. And so this is a photograph of our first set of uh, successful 3D printed greenware parts uh, I took out the proprietary media, which at that time cost about $600 a bucket, mixed up my own uh, high fire dry uh, stoneware, clay stoneware, uh, with a little bit of maltodextrin, a fiber uh, that you can purchase at a local grocery store, a little bit of sugar, both of which facilitate the printing process. And I was sort of blown away by the, the success of these initial printed parts, uh, which opened up a whole series of, of new questions on the topic of digital ceramics. And, and this just really blew me, away, blew me away in terms of the potential of leveraging 3D printing, non-standard components and directly printing with clay. And so here you can see the same part printed with the proprietary media on the left and uh, the, that part printed with our clay recipe, bisque fired, so chemically changed to ceramic and then glaze fired. So this has led to a series of, of seminars and option studios on the topic of digital ceramics. Uh, so like many of you, uh, my core research also influences my teaching and vice versa. Um, and this represents over a decade of inquiry uh, into digital ceramics um, where students um, explore algorithmic design techniques uh, and these are integrated with digital fabrication for the production of ceramic uh, components and 3D tiles at a range of scales and applications. In my lab, uh, we have focused primarily in the recent past um, here at Cornell on bricks. Uh, and bricks have not changed a whole lot uh, in many, 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 many years uh, because of how they are made. And so with 3D printing, of course, shape is cheap, material is expensive. We have the opportunity to explore the non-standard where every single brick can be different as long as there is a coherence for how they come together, uh, it's a viable option. Uh, so there's a potential of working locally on site. Imagine bringing a slew of 3D printers working with local earth and clay matter um, and therefore sort of tapping into uh, supply chains of material in much more efficient and sustainable ways. Uh, so this was Polybrick 1.0, uh, where we were kind of working out some of the technical questions, exploring uh, hollow bricks. And now with Polybrick 2.0, we're turning to nature uh, for a set of design drivers uh, specifically looking at human bone formation uh, with a collaborator, Dr. Christopher Hernandez, who's a mechanical engineer with expertise in the mechanics of bone to optimize for load conditions. Uh, so imagine a highly porous wall that's very dense at the base where the loads are the greatest, but as you move up the wall, it becomes increasingly more porous uh, and leveraging the promise of building with holes. Uh, which seems like a paradox, but we actually see that everywhere in nature. So extremely lightweight structures that locally are fragile, but uh, globally are extremely robust and strong. 
And so we have worked at multiple scales to refine um, these inquiries and also have tapped into the more phenomenal conditions that are possible with the prospect of hollow brick configurations. Uh, with Polybrick 3.0, um, this is in collaboration with Dan Lau, who I mentioned earlier, and his lab at Cornell, uh, we have been developing a glaze, a, a living glaze, uh, through working with specific DNA sequences uh, that control uh, fluorescing. And we've actually had a, a great deal more success than both Dan and I had anticipated and have discovered that Clay is an incredible host uh, for life. Uh, and we sort of dialed down and scale to control some of these signatures, uh, working with hydrogels, which is what the DNA is infused within. And now I'm really excited uh, about our latest uh, trajectories and that we're working at scale. So this is the scale of a typical um, five inch by five inch uh, tile, uh, working with micro texturing um, through direct 3D printing of porcelain in this case, uh, and plating that with hydrogels to control again at a very fine scale uh, how light is, is being emitted. So our, the first phase of polytile is to control how light is, is being emitted. And our next phase is to begin to introduce other functionalities and characteristics through the design of DNA in the way that proteins, for example, are interacting with, with the local environment uh, so that we have some degree of response with the local environment with the kind of bigger ambition and aim uh, that we could have a tile um, with this living glaze uh, that could clean uh, the local air of particular you know, particulate matters and so on. And then lastly, in the sequence uh, with uh, the micro texturing uh, and specifically we're looking at pitcher plants in this case, uh, in a biological example, uh, looking at the micro texturing of those specific plants and the, their super hydrophobic and super hydrophilic uh, properties uh, to then translate that uh, into a patterning at a micro scale that's then 3D printed uh, to control the direction of, of water flow. And so here you can see in the tile how the droplets of water are um, being held in these dimples. Uh, here the tiles turned at 90 degrees and you can see that it still adheres uh, to that area of patterning uh, with the goal of beginning to look at uh, tiled wall systems that could direct water uh, for passive cooling, for example, or to contribute to green walls and the growth of plants. So with that, I'm going to play a short video that summarizes um, some of these research projects uh, here. Let's see if I can go back and play that. Hold on one second here. I need to... There we go. The production of ceramic blocks and tiles has a long technological and design history. Ceramic modules of standard measurement have been used as building block in replacement of stone for many centuries. Ceramic bricks and tiles, so ubiquitous in their application in the built environment, have surprisingly lacked recognition as a viable building component in contemporary architecture practice until now. Polybrick, our latest endeavor under the topic of digital ceramics in the Sabin Design Lab at Cornell University, showcases next steps in the integration of complex phenomena. This work includes advances in digital technology, 3D printing, advanced geometry, and material practices in arts, crafts, and design disciplines. 
first phase of the Polybrick series features the use of algorithmic design techniques for the digital fabrication and production of non-standard ceramic brick components for the mortarless assembly and installation of the first fully 3D printed and fired ceramic brick componentry. Polybrick 2.0 is generated with the rules, principles, and behavior of human bone formation. This allows for the production of variegated bricks that are light and porous at the top of the wall and dense at the base to carry load and maintain efficient structural integrity, while also amplifying material and formal expressions. Polybrick 3.0 takes our material investigations to the next level. Synthetically designed with advanced bioengineering, these biobricks will exemplify the cutting edge and future of biologically steered clay and ceramic building blocks in architecture. The two prototypes utilize 3D printed clay, hydrogel, and synthetic DNA. As you can see here, a unique ID stamped with DNA in the form of a C for Cornell is fluorescing within the polybrick clay body. Brick stamping has a long history where variegated size, shape, and stamping indicate place, date of construction, and type, and thus serve as invaluable historical documents. With our unique DNA stamps and glaze, we explore the possibility of live signatures and dynamic surface techniques coupled with non-standard bricks in the context of living matter and digital ceramics. So that work is, is ongoing uh, in my lab um, and we're currently uh, placing a lot of emphasis on the uh, human bone formation uh, as a set of design drivers, uh, as well as working with Dan Lau and his team on, on the programmable uh, living glaze with DNA sequences. And I just wanna check, is that showing full screen on your end? Yes, I see, okay. it, we see full screen. Okay, great. Perfect. Uh, so I'm coming to the, the last of the three uh, topical areas, uh, looking at adaptive environments. Um, and this chapter of the, the talk uh, really begins to unfold some of the larger architectural projects uh, that have uh, been developed in my practice. Um, conceptually, the lab and the ongoing research at Cornell is, is very much linked uh, with the work that I'm doing in, in my practice. Although we have different teams and different, different funding structures and the, the rhythms of the work are, are also different uh, with the research, we're able to chase a topic for sometimes up to four years. And in the practice, uh, it's much more fast paced uh, in terms of working with clients and budgets and uh, programs and, and so on. Uh, but they really inform each other and, and allow and the practice me to take fundamental research that has reached a certain maturity uh, into application and to really understand its viability um, at scale. And so I'll, I'll touch upon Lumen for MoMA and MoMA PS1, uh, which we were fortunate to win uh, this prestigious competition in 2017. As you can see, it takes an army of amazing people uh, to pull off this extraordinary uh, project. Um, and this project really built upon years of research and development uh, through a series of commissions and projects um, starting in 2012, uh, which also leverage our ongoing research and designing with light and energy, uh, considering structural color, uh, adaptive materials, uh, designing at the fiber scale, at the knit scale, uh, engaging in alternative digital fabrication processes emanating from the textile industry and so on. And the first project uh, was uh, for Nike. Uh, this is the MyThread Pavilion uh, and Nike was about to launch a new technology, uh, Flyknit, uh, which all of you I'm sure are familiar with now. And they started the Flyknit Collective and invited six designers and artists from around the world uh, to 
riff on and be inspired by the core benefits of Flynet, including performance, sustainability, um, form fitting, and, and so on. And I represented the states and my city was New York City and I proposed uh, to develop a pavilion that would work with knitting. I thought it was sort of obvious, um, but importantly, to incorporate a set of design drivers, uh, bio data sets uh, that we collected uh, through a series of workshops um, that would be attached to the knitting properties. So not as a mapping or a representation, but to really explore the hidden structures of that data uh, and how that would uh, affect uh, tension, uh, material striation, uh, material response, and, and so on. And this was also the first time that I began working with uh, high-tech responsive photo photoluminescent fibers and solar active fibers, and also collaborating with Shima Siki, who's at the forefront of what's called whole garment knitting. Uh, so digitally knitting um, seamless 3D forms, uh, which worked quite well uh, for this project. Um, I'll spare you the stories of how long it took to get to that, that point, um, but we, we've now been collaborating since uh, 2012, really pushing each other in terms of scale and, and really what's possible. Uh, this, this project uh, allowed us to take some, some new steps. Uh, this was for the Cooper Hewitt as part of their design triennial. Uh, polythread. Um, and in all of these projects, my years of deep research and investigation with, with Peter in the context of Lab Studio, exploring the morphologies of cellular systems, you know, looking at how a cell networks with its neighbor to form larger surfaces, how cells design surfaces uh, through the reciprocity between DNA and context. Um, how those surfaces bifurcate to create larger morphologies um, is really brought to, to this work. Uh, again, not as a simple mimicking or translation, but a deep biosynthesis, a biosynthetic way of thinking um, between part to whole surface morphology dynamics, the flow of forces through these multicellular systems and so on. So we started to look at a double surface, um, and this was also the first time that I began co collaborating with Arup uh, to, to really start to dial in the complexity of how forces are flowing through these knit structures. Um, knitting is, as many of you know who are working with it, um, it's sort of <laughs> beauty is that it's hard to control, um, but that's also <laughs> you know, the difficulty of working with it. Uh, so we, we took all of these stress tests uh, back into our simulation tools uh, to define things like a stretch factor that we could rely upon at scale. Um, and here you can see that double surface where, where structurally the, the cones are acting as springs. Um, and so all of these surface structures are composed of individually digitally knit uh, cells and conical forms that are then finished and sewn together through bespoke patterns uh, to create the larger uh, surface assemblies. Um, and here you can see the photoluminescent fibers activated and the construction uh, highlighted through the striations, um, referencing the, the whole garment uh, process. So literally knitting link by link, row by row, uh, continuously. And so when it came to the project uh, for MoMA and MoMA PS1, and there were a few other projects along the way, I felt confident that we were, we were ready to really take this outside. Um, I felt confident in the, the material system. And I, I knew if we were going to win this project, uh, we, had, we couldn't start from scratch. We really needed to bring, you know, some, design methodologies, fabrication strategies, and uh, material systems on board um, that were tested and, and could really be pushed. So this was our proposal video that I presented as, as part of the, the panel, um, the formidable panel, I'll never forget that day. Um, but the, the brief, if you're not familiar with the Young Architects Program, uh, calls for an installation that occupies uh, the courtyard area of MoMA PS1, which is in Long Island City, uh, which serves as a, 
as a space, as a backdrop uh, for many events, including the popular warm up series, which is on Saturdays, where they invite DJs uh, from all over the world to perform. Uh, there has to be a water element. Uh, it gets quite hot, um, as you can imagine, over the summer months. Uh, so some element of water to provide reprieve from the heat, uh, as well as seating. And Sean Anderson, who was the curator that year and head of YAP, um, in designing the brief, was interested in aspects of materiality and transformation, which really resonated with me. Uh, for the seating, we deconstructed spools, a CNC the tops and bottoms, and for the prototypes, um, wound them uh, with uh, our robots in the lab. And these spool stools um, featured a photoluminescent microcord, so they would glow at night. And so I was, I was really interested in how the project could operate as an environment, uh, work with the local context. Uh, so the distribution of, of cells and their configuration uh, took into account how they would work and attach to the existing matrix of courtyard walls. Uh, as well as providing uh, shade uh, and reprieve from, from the sun. This is a, an image of, of the project at, at night. Um, there are two canopy structures, uh, one that occupies uh, the main um, courtyard space as well as the smaller one. Um, this is by far the largest uh, project uh, working with these systems that we've developed um, and produced to date. Uh, so we're looking at about 150 feet um, in width here by 90 feet. And, you know, for me, one of the most exciting aspects of the project was to see how people took ownership um, and engaged with it by day and night um, with the intention that one's experience of Lumen would be very different depending on uh, the time of day and, and evening when you were occupying it. So here you can see the photoluminescent fibers being activated, uh, the subtle changes of color uh, through the solar active fibers, and uh, a drawing highlighting the finishing. Uh, my sewer and finisher, Dazian, who I've worked with for many years now, they talked about how they started on the West Coast and ended on the East Coast. So they literally work at a one-to-one -one scale. So we produced a tile drawing that was the exact same size as the large courtyard, for example. Uh, some details of it stitched uh, into the courtyard. Um, and everything was designed to be dynamic uh, in terms of how it would respond to rain, how it would respond to the wind. Um, this detail in terms of the webbing is something I'm particularly proud of. Uh, which has been innovated over, over the years uh, and is incredibly important because the primary tension forces in this uh, net are, are taken through the webbing net and not um, so much through the net itself. In terms of the water component, uh, there was an interactive misting system uh, that was organized along the top of the canopy structure and housed in the webbing and through uh, the integration of some basic infrared sensors uh, connected to the solenoid valves. Uh, they would detect people and, and so the effect was this sense of breathing and kind of hissing and it actually really worked uh, to cool uh, the local microclimate underneath the canopy structures um, during the, the hot summer days in, in 2017. And just some final uh, photographs. This is the smaller courtyard uh, which was one of my favorite areas uh, just in terms of the kind of intimacy uh, that it, it um, afforded. Uh, there are three large uh, tensegrity towers, uh, just to add a kind of third um, envelope of, of equilibrium to the project uh, that were strategically located at the centers of the large canopy uh, to lift them up. Um, and they were designed and engineered uh, to take live loads, but of course people were discouraged from climbing them, but of course they did. Uh, we worked with a, a, a manufacturer in the Northwest that usually produces these ropes. Uh, all these ropes were custom made uh, for the fishing industry. So that was a, a really you know, wonderful kind of new collaboration. And I was sort of blown away by um, how many people attended uh, Lumen. This is you know, an image in our current 
context, uh, something we can't, I think we, we all hope to you know, get back to, but I can't quite believe. Um, but on any given Saturday, Lumen was uh, visited by between five to 7,000 people attending the warm up events. And the project held up uh, quite well, even despite uh, the sheer numbers of, of people uh, that attended. And so, as I mentioned, for me, the, the most exciting aspect of the project um, and the success of it uh, was, was really to see the joy and the wonder and um, the ownership that people um, took in inhabiting this project and really taking advantage of uh, the aspects of kind of transformation and change um, that it inspired. And as a side note, uh, to my great surprise, it, it, in 2017, it was in the top five most Instagrammed uh, projects. She, she does photograph quite well, uh, which um, for my practice opened up a, a whole number of, of new opportunities um, just in terms of the excitement uh, around the project. So in my last few minutes, um, I'm going to show a recent project uh, that we finished last year uh, for Microsoft Research. And uh, this project uh, certainly builds upon uh, Lumen and the previous projects and uh, core research in my lab, uh, but also opened up uh, new questions uh, in terms of adaptation and, and response uh, and working with artificial intelligence um, as, a, as a platform for human engagement. And Microsoft Research uh, invited me as part of their artists and designer in residence program. And they were interested in how I might uh, incorporate the topic of AI. Um, and we spent several months collaborating, having uh, discussions around issues, sort of ethical issues, issues of privacy, um, thinking about how we could potentially develop a project that would be fundamentally um, kind of human-centered, uh, considering you know, that technology is, is fundamentally human, and uh, to also develop a platform for research uh, for researchers at, at Microsoft Research. Uh, so I'll, I'll play a little video here to give you a summary of the project. Um, Ada is driven by artificial intelligence. It's a project that smiles back at you. The name comes from Ada Loveless, one of the first computer programmers and the linkages between weaving and computation. Nadine is, is one of the earliest examples of 3D printing, additively layering link by link, row by row material. The project features soft forms that are more feminine versus masculine, and that's a paradigm shift in architecture. The shape of Ada is an ellipsoid. It features a unique exoskeleton composed of a network of fiberglass rods and 3D printed nodes. Every single node is different and has a unique ID attached to it. The interior surface is composed of hundreds of digitally knit cones and cells in a network of webbing. In the center of Ada is a large tensegrity cone composed of a skin of fiber optic cables. Photoluminescent fiber absorbs energy from the lighting and then emits that back as knitted light, as glowing light but the real magic comes through how people actually engage with it. On the interior soft surface is a whole network of LEDs connected to a network of cameras within the atrium, reading the facial expressions of people in an anonymous way. When Building 99 is very active, the project will be very vibrant and highly transformative. There are moments where it blushes. 
the hope is that people realize their engagement is actually driving the project that the project begins to gain its own life in the way that it is interacting with people So it was a tremendous experience to work with researchers at Microsoft Research, um, you know, to be sort of dropped into their world and, and um, explore some of the incredible innovations that they're making, um, and specifically to work uh, with the team uh, whose expertise is in AI and, and looking at uh, how these machine learning algorithms uh, can detect changes in facial patterns, uh, but importantly to understand how our environment affects uh, sentiment in terms of thinking about issues of well-being and health. And, and so that became a big part of, of the project. Um, and we made some, some big technological leaps too. This was the first time that we worked uh, with a semi-rigid exoskeleton. Uh, so building upon uh, some of the previous steps such as with polythread. Uh, so we have this interior soft surface and exterior semi-rigid compressive shell working reciprocally in terms of the, the structure. Um, some details of that uh, you can see much more refined in comparison to polythread um, so that these cones acting as springs um, you know, under a lot of tension. Um, and as you can imagine, they depend on each other, right? So the, the, the compressive shell needs the, the tension of the net and so on, uh, which pose some really challenge, uh, big challenges in terms of installation. Um, it was incredibly laborious. Uh, we learned quite a lot. Uh, and just uh, some diagrams of the software pipeline. Uh, the, the architecture of this uh, was set up to be um, highly, uh, you know, adaptive in terms of working with multiple data feeds. Uh, so it, it taps into uh, a, a cloud uh, platform that's collecting all of the uh, facial pattern data from the network of cameras uh, and then passed into our software pipeline that then uh, is distributed and adjusts uh, the, a three tiered lighting system, which then in turn alters uh, the responses of the materials. Uh, parameterizing color with, with sentiment, which we had numerous conversations around uh, what these words uh, mean culturally uh, and the ethics around that. Um, and so again, these are, these are all parameters that can be adjusted um, where we can feature uh, collective sentiment. So reading the sentiment of the building, for example. Um, so uh, you know, what was the sentiment of the, of the building on any given day? or individual uh, sentiment. Uh, if one's inside of this, the main, the central camera on the tensegrity cone uh, can override all of the other cameras uh, with uh, you know, the interest in, in allowing people to drive uh, the project. This was also the first time that we started to work with um, fiber optics, which has been exciting in, in terms of getting into a really fine scale of programming. Of, of the fiber systems. So an important uh, aim of the project is to expand and inspire human engagement. And while artificial intelligence powers the project through the precise narrowing and statistical averaging of data collected from both individual and collective uh, facial patterns and voice tones, the architecture, the hope is that the architecture of ADA augments human emotion through aesthetic experience and aspects of beauty, uh, thereby opening the range of possible human emotional engagement as new information back into the field. Uh, in turn, uh, the project opens new pathways uh, for fundamental research on the use of AI uh, to correlate connections between human sentiment and the local environment uh, to tap into issues of, of health and well wellness and well-being. And importantly, ADA will also be used as a platform uh, for researchers um, at Microsoft Research to test their data and machine learning algorithms. And so unlike the pioneering work of uh, the likes of Mark Sager, uh, such as his Baby X project uh, that seeks to humanize AI through, quote, more symbiotic relationships between humans and machines, 
Ada does not appear lifelike. Uh, instead, Ada offers subtle and abstract interactions with humans through space, material, and form to augment and expand our emotional range and in a specific context, in this case, an office environment, uh, which in turn affects the probable sentiment of data being collected, um, as I mentioned, as new information in the field. And some final images uh, uh, taken from above, uh, considering how you know, the spaces uh, and environments that we inhabit um, influence and partially shape who we are and, and how we're feeling. And so the, it's through the inner, integration of responsive materials and emerging technologies that Ada offers an interface uh, for perhaps personalizing architecture uh, to make it more human uh, and uh, reflexive. And so with that, I will conclude. Um, we are a we, as uh, hopefully has been clear, not an I. Uh, these are some of the amazing people I've had the pleasure to work with in the past and in the present. Um, and we've been fortunate to receive uh, quite a lot of, of fantastic funding, uh, both federal grants as well as uh, industry partnerships. Uh, and I've given you a summary of, of work. Uh, if you're interested in looking at um, more of our research projects or practice work, this is where you can find us. Uh, we also have all of our technical peer reviewed papers um, posted if you wanna take a deeper dive into any one of these. And with that, I will uh, conclude. Uh, thanks so much for your attention and for attending uh, this, this evening. And I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, in the time that remains. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was really an impressive uh, uh, trip. You, you were uh, tra traveling with us through the body of your work and it's striking that this provides us a look into the past and seeing how pioneer your work has, uh, pioneering your work has been, but also really shows us a, a view to the future. And um, I congratulate you for this work. I do think we have uh, multiple questions. I, I would have one, but it's also asked already here. Um, so I just go to the chat and I think it's a twofold question. One is about maybe, um, the education. Huh? So what would uh, you, you show, and I think it relates to the interdisciplinarity. Huh? So what would you think uh, as an educator, how, how what you, do you recommend, what should future architects learn in school? How do you build up your curriculum to be able to, to maybe design or create the worlds that you are designing? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, I think, I mean, I think it's important that we, we have an expertise, uh, you know, that we, we don't just become kind of dilettantes dabbling into different areas. So, you know, having a core foundation um, in, in design and uh, bringing that, you know, that ability for synthesis to assess a complex array of, of relationships and conditions to form a plan and, and to take action. You know, our, the way that we think in design is, is incredibly relevant uh, right now across disciplinary boundaries for a number of reasons, uh, especially considering the crises that we, that we've, we face. Um, I have always maintained the, in, in the context of my collaborations, uh, maintained the importance of of my kind of disciplinary core and how that's brought to a table of, of collaborators that also have their own expertise. Um, so collaborating with material scientists as opposed to uh, trying to do some of that, you know, kind of work in our, in our, our own lab. Um, one of the things that I think is so incredibly important right now in education is to offer more opportunities for figuring out how to collaborate and um, as I mentioned early on in the talk, you know, that an ability to share language, uh, figure out how to navigate our days, um, uh, engage in collaborative teaching platforms, that all, that all takes quite a lot of, of work. Um, and so, for example, in my new master's program, 
um, the students from the very beginning, uh, the first studio and, and attached seminar, they work in teams uh, with students from Cornell Tech, which is our, our tech hub based in New York City. And so on any given team, you have an architect, an MBA student, uh, a computer scientist, um, uh, someone whose expertise is in uh, health tech, um, perhaps a biologist, and, and they're working on a common problem, but you know, bringing their expertise together. And so learning how to think in a hybrid fashion across disciplines, I think is, is incredibly important, but coming to that with a, a disciplinary expertise, I think is, is also equally important. Thank you. I mean, uh, the question was from Jal. Jal, if you want to add something, or um, otherwise I would have a follow-up uh, question to this. You were talking about disciplinary, uh, the core disciplinary knowledge as well, and you made a, a kind of funny comparison between architects uh, not being pseudoscientists huh? and so on. But I wonder, because um, how do you see the relation between architecture, science, and research, huh? uh, design and research, for example, if you could elaborate a little bit on this and how you would define the roles here? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I mentioned that Peter and I spent a year just figuring out how to talk to each other, um, he was, you know, <laughs> initially completely freaked out by the culture of the critique, mm -hmm. right? And uh, he just thought we were so awful to our students. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that the culture of the critique is so much a part of uh, the training and in, in terms of students learning how to effectively communicate their design arguments um, through drawing, but also through language. And, you know, the, there are some key differences in, in how we explore the education of, of design and the pedagogy of the studio. Um, but I also think there's a lot of opportunity to bring that into research. And, um, I mean, for me, you know, we for years now have been operating a, across the silos and, and trying to break down th those walls to create a, a, a new model for how research is done. Um, and, you know, in some cases, I have encountered collaborators who are not necessarily interested in that kind of hybrid condition. Um, but I think we're increasingly seeing opportunities to open up, you know, moments of synergy between what's going on in research, but also in terms of bringing together science and, and design. And, you know, in the context of, um, you know, big data, making sense of data, it's the, the role of design in that is, is huge, right? And so our ability to synthesize and to bring tools to kind of make sense of these systems is incredibly relevant amongst many, I mean, there are many topics that we could talk about, um, but how science is done is that in that context is completely opening up, right? So moving away from the kind of reductive uh, inquiry to a sing, you know, looking at singularities and particular events to looking at a field of events and trying to make sense of that field has been actually a really fruitful uh, terrain for me to occupy with my students and um, you know, developing parametric models of these massive data sets to make sense of them. So all of that to say that I, I think there's lots of room for disruption and um, useful disruption in, in what we bring in the design space uh, to science and, and vice versa. I mean, I am a better architect because of what I do with my collaborators in the sciences. And, and I would like to think that they probably would say the same, that they're a better scientist because of what's been sort of opened up um, through design and the kind of the speculative and projective aspects of our practice. Thank you, John. That, that's, I think, uh, really also aspects that, that in our research context we are often have to deal with and become more and more relevant indeed. Huh? Another question that is related to your work, I think there's a lot of inventions and you talk about also industry collaborations that you had, you had many research grants and 
uh, in your group uh, or also in your practice, are you also interested in a kind of spin-off uh, trajectory? Would you see this also as a possible step for future architects? And do you have experience with that? Or is it something you're not interested in going? Yeah, no, I'm definitely interested in it. Um, I mean, practically, speaking it, it also comes down to there are only so many hours in a day and <laughs> what i'm trying to do is already impossible you know running a practice and a lab and teaching and and uh, trying to craft a new model for education through my administrative work um but yeah there currently we're i'm working on a project with shima siki um where we we hope to produce and it's we're sort of at the scale of furniture right now, but produce an object that could potentially um, be a product um, that that could contribute to a spinoff. Well, we'll see. I mean, thus far, my lab has not been so concretely connected to the practice. It's been more tangential, as I described. Um, but I'm increasingly pushing it to have a tighter connection uh, so that we can look at applications that that might move into that space. So the answer is yes. Um, I yeah, I need more time in the day, <laughs> or or to you know have a have a team that's focused on that. If if really if there are other other questions, further questions, you, you feel free to raise your voice also. You don't need to use the chat. Otherwise, maybe the, I would I would have, of course, uh, that's a typical question, but but it's a question that I think is especially important in your work because you have been ahead of a lot of research streams and so. So, what's next for you? Like you are now um, you you uh, you investigate a lot, for example, in textiles and three D printing. Is this are these two trajectories that are you still continuing to work on, or do you also target new fields, or do you seek how to scale up these methods even further? Yeah, so in, in my practice, we actually just opened uh, a large canopy structure that's part of a public beach activation project in Abu Dhabi, um, which will be up for two plus years, um, open to the public. And that was an incredible experience in terms of R&D, you know, so exploring the fibers that could withstand extreme climate conditions. So heat, extreme sun, sand. And that, that led to a collaboration with Gore. I'm sure you're, you know of Gore, uh, where we developed an entirely new responsive material, a PTFE material. Um, and so I'm super excited about the projects that are coming in in my practice that are um, more permanent kind of longer range projects that also at the same time are pushing pushing back into the lab uh, through research. So so that's been exciting and and we have some new projects on the boards um, that are permanent architectural projects which, which I'm excited about. Um, so the answer is yes we, we're continuing to push opportunities in textile material systems um, but kind of moving beyond the the install temporary installation to more permanent uh, structures. And in my in my lab, um, I'm really proud of the new program that we launched three years ago, uh, which allows students to come in, work on core research, uh, receive funding, um, and develop theses and, and uh, publish papers on you know, in a space that has taken me about 15 years to finally, you know, get here. And, and related to that, we have uh, some tremendous people in leadership right now, uh, including our Dean Mi Jin Yoon uh, within the College of Architecture, Art and Planning, uh, where under my administrative role as Associate Dean for Design Initiatives, we're Taking taking this to the university level, um, I can't provide details, but I'm I'm just I'm so excited about uh, the 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 voice and the kind of exposure that the work is is getting, and and also the relevance that design has in science and vice versa, and um, how that's being taken seriously at, at the levels that it, it needs to uh, in in order to make what I think will be 
the next level of impact um, in terms of pedagogy and research, which goes back to your your question. Um, so. Yeah, that's uh, we are. I think uh, I'm sure we are all looking forward for those those works or those developments. So that that it's important that your work has an impact and uh, continues to have an impact. And we are all curious about your next uh, projects. We hope to. Uh, hopefully next time that we can invite you physically. Huh? To be honest, I have to say, I became a bit melancholic looking at, as you mentioned, also the crowds in the PS1 party, those uh, are events that we currently can't have, but next time you can visit ETH, we will have a crowd uh, at our institute. Yeah? With that, I would like to close today's uh, webinar and I wish you all a nice uh, evening or day in your case, uh, Jenny. Stay healthy and goodbye. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a sincere pleasure and I look forward to visiting. Take care.